Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I'll give you a tour of Weldon's Practical Needlework Volume 8, and I'll share the repairs I made to a sweater elbow. So let's get started. This tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed. It's an article that was in the Washington Post about an organization that was started this past fall called Loose Ends. I realized as soon as I was reading it that someone in my Zoom knitting group had mentioned this a few weeks ago. Loose Ends is a group of volunteers who finish the UFOs, the unfinished objects, of people who have died and then return the projects to the family members who have requested help. I thought it was a really great idea. So I'm gonna leave a link to the article down below. Now the article might be behind a paywall for you. So if it is, um, you can also look at the organization's website, which I'll leave a link to as well. They have lots of information uh, on the website about how you can volunteer to finish projects for uh, other people who might need that. Last week, I was sharing a tidbit about a book that explored examples of textiles that had been made using a technique called Sprang. I mentioned that I had heard of Sprang, but I didn't really know what it was, just that it had been frequently mistaken for knitting or knotting. And I asked you guys if you knew of any good sources of information like videos or articles about Sprang so that I could learn more, but then I could share that with you and all of you could learn as well. Well, I got a message from Imza on Ravelry who gave me a link to a video about making the exact replica of a spring sash that was given to George Washington on the battlefield. Looking at a close-up of the fabric, I could see why some people might mistake this technique for knitting. Imza wasn't the only one who provided leads on how I could learn more about what spring was. Many people recommended Sally Pointer as a good resource. Now I actually subscribed to her YouTube channel a couple of years ago, but I just didn't think of her off the top of my head as a place to look for information about this technique. So I'm glad people brought her up because it put her back on my radar. She has a video de demonstrating the actual process of doing spring, as well as a playlist of videos on her channel about the topic of spring, netting, and braiding, which I will link to down below. At least some of the videos in the playlist are actually on other channels, but she is a guest in the, the videos that are in that playlist, which is why they're included on her channel. Those videos might well lead you down a rabbit hole of other interesting textile related topics uh, and, and YouTube channels. This tidbit came to me from googling around a few weeks back trying to find information about how early knitted stockings were mended. I had often read descriptions of extant stockings that are in museums and how they had been repaired using a variety of different methods uh, including using the leg of a different stocking to create a new foot or patching or replacing the foot of a stocking with woven cloth. There were a lot of different uh, ways of replacing entire feet, but sometimes the, the existing feet were just patched and repaired in other ways. 19th century knitting books often include instructions for how to darn stockings using a woven darn, um, but also by using duplicate stitch, a technique that they usually uh, refer to as Swiss darning. Well, this article that I came across when I was Googling was written by Emily Whitted, a name I have seen come up a few times in the past couple of years. I've seen her do Zoom presentations. I've seen her um, post things on Twitter. Uh, she does a lot of research on early knitting here in the US. So this article that she wrote begins, Stephen Gerard, the wealthiest man in the early republic, 
had a secret hidden inside his shoes. From his knees to his ankles, his legs were clad in fine silk stockings imported from France with delicate silk embroidery known as clocking on display when wearing breeches. But below the ankle, his stocking feet were thick with mended areas known as darns made to repair holes in the fabric. There are some really great photos of those stockings in this article where you can see all of the different patches and the different sorts of techniques that were used to prepare his, uh, to repair his stockings. And I'll leave a link down below so you can read the entire article as well as see those items up close. In December 2022, I purchased a 12-volume set of Weldon's Practical Needlework. These are facsimile copies of the first 12 years Weldon's published its popular series, which started in 1886. These facsimile copies were published by Piecework Magazine in the early 2000s, and each volume represents one full year of monthly issues, with each issue devoted to a specific needlecraft, like knitting, crocheting, edgings, patchwork, macrame, tatting, embroidery, etc. So each week I've been giving you a tour of one of these volumes. Piecework no longer sells these hard copy facsimile copies, but they do sell digital copies of the knitting and crocheting issues on their website. So let's go to the overhead and explore what volume eight has for us. The issues in this volume were originally published in 1893. Oftentimes a given issue of Weldon's Practical Knitter is devoted to a particular theme. So it could be edgings, it could be stockings. Um, this one is devoted to knitting in initials, figures, meaning numbers, clocks, which they are spelling with an X. Uh, and then there's a couple of patterns for gentlemen's socks and boys' socks. So they have some introductory information about uh, knitting uh, the letters and, and numbers in there because you're working top down. So you're gonna be creating these upside down and they have some tips for, um, since you're knitting the stocking in the round and the color work is only over a very small number of stitches to switch to working in rows back and forth while you are working um, that little bit of color work and then you can resume working in the round after that. And then you just do a little seam up the back where you would switch to working back and forth. So that's often what I do. If I'm knitting a hat that has some kind of a small intarsia design, I'll just switch to knitting flat. I'll, I typically will cast on like using a backwards loop one extra stitch when I switch to working in rows. And then I will decrease that out when I switch back to working in the round. And then when I'm seaming, I just use a one half of a stitch on each side. So that creates a very flat seam on the inside. And it, you can't tell from the outside that there is a seam there. So they have written instructions for every single letter every number, every, every type of thing. It's written instructions. But they do have engravings for what the letters look like. And you can see that the stitches are upside down because the Vs are upside down because you'd be working in that direction if you were working your sock cuff down. So you could refer to something like this instead. I haven't found any patterns from this era or even into the early 20th century where they would use a knitting chart, even for color work, it was it would be written out. This is kind of a substitute as a chart. And oftentimes people kept knitted samplers, like a long strip, and every time they came across an interesting stitch pattern, they would just add that to their sampler. And they would use basically the sampler as their stitch dictionary or as their chart, and they would just read the knitting. So this is the same kind of idea. And so you've got the lowercase letters here. So they've also got numbers and they've got like straight up and down numbers and ones that look more italicized. I have some stockings that I bought at an auction last year that were from the like the 1860s and those do not have the initials or numbers knitted in. They were embroidered in. Uh, and so I think sometimes people would put initials of the person in maybe the year that they were knit. The stockings that I have um, it has her initials and then it just has the number of the pair. 
So it might be number four or number 13 or something like that. She didn't have the, the year in there. Here are what they're calling clocks. So clocks are decorations that you'd see down at the, the ankle level. And so these are little decorations that you could knit in uh, at the ankles of the stockings. And then they're explaining here in this introductory information uh, about using silk. If, you were, if you're doing clocks and initials that historically in woven hosiery that you would use silk to embroidery, embroider the clocks down near the ankles and so that would be appropriate um, for for knitting as well using a really good quality of silk yarn and then if you were putting clocks in and you're using that silk yarn to use that silk up to do the initials as well and then you have a few stocking patterns for boys and for men to uh, fill out this particular issue. So this next issue is a more general. It doesn't have a, a theme like this. There's just, but they do say there's gentlemen's garments, cuffs, gloves, children's things, doilies, combination garment, uh, which is underwear that combines the upper and lower body parts, socks, stockings, etc. So you see a variety of things, a little uh, child's glove, a little knitted ball shaped like an orange. Um, a little pattern that you could put on a, on a border for something. And then there's this beaded cuff here. There are a couple of different ways of adding beads to your knitting. In one case, you're going to thread all of the beads onto the yarn ahead of time and push all of those beads along the strand of yarn, which is going to kind of wear away at them. So you need a sturdy yarn. And then as it's time to use a bead, you'd slide that bead up to where you were actually knitting a stitch. And that's what, what the instructions are calling for here. There's another method where you can just add beads as you need them using a crochet hook so that you are uh, mounting that bead onto a loop. So if, if the loop is two strands, like at the bend of of the yarn that you're you're pulling through, the, the bead would be on that. Whereas if you're uh, stranding them onto the yarn, the bead bead would be around one strand, what just be on the strand of yarn. There's a, a men's undershirt, under vest. There's a nice quilt block. This is actually not worked in the round, as you might think. It, by looking at it, it's, you knit the triangles separately and then seam them together. And then we've got some doilies. And then here we see gentlemen's socks with divided toe. And that pattern is actually on the next page, which is right here. So I was really surprised to see something like that. And I wondered if they had an explanation for this. Uh, like why, because sometimes if something's really unusual, they'll explain what the purpose of it is. But sometimes if it's just something that would have been very common in that time period, they don't, they don't explain, like they don't explain what the purpose of socks are. <laughs> you kind of know. But that I was looking like, it's not like they're going to be wearing sandals that have you know, something going in between their toes. And they don't really explain like why you would want it. It says these socks are peculiar in having a separate compartment for the big toe. And to ensure this object, they are knitted in such a way as to make the right and left foot correspond one with the other. Something after the fashion of baby's bag gloves meaning mittens. Uh, they are comfortable wear and are generally very well liked when one gets accustomed to them. So I, I'm not sure why they are recommending something like that. I also thought this edging was interesting. This is done in garter stitch. So they've got some more stockings. This I thought was interesting. These are ladies leggings or riding pants. So this is like an extra layer of warmth under your skirts and you'd wear these over the top of whatever drawers you're actually wearing and then just belt them around. So you could just take, you could put them on and take them off when you're fully dressed and add some extra warmth. And they, the proportion of them, it's kind of hard to tell. 
exactly how long they go. I didn't read what the final length is. So I don't know if these hit like below the knee so they cross over the stockings or if these are meant to actually go all the way down to the ankle. But I, I hadn't seen anything like that before. And, um, you know, they keep this part open, like your drawers, they, they didn't pull their drawers down to go to the, the bathroom. There would have been a split in the, in the under drawers. So this keeps that available so they can still relieve themselves if they need to. And they've got little babies combination, little babies, mittens, and uh, a knitted cuff, keeping your wrists warm. So that was just very general thing, but I had to have some really interesting things in that particular issue. So here's one of the ones where they, it's specialized uh, and it's focused on knitting clothing for dolls, which I thought, oh, that's so great. There's a few items in here for little babies as well, but mostly it's, it's clothing for dolls. And I think I imagine <laughs> knitters had as much fun knitting that stuff as they do nowadays. Making those little tiny things can be really uh, fun to do. So this is all doll clothing. This is a, a chemise, a doll's drawers, a petticoat with a fancy border, doll's petticoat in a striped pattern, a little outfit, little bo doll, boy doll in a jersey suit. So uh, there's a little hood and brioche, a doll's fancy pattern for boudiquins, doll's hood and plain knitting, Dolly Eleanor, really decked out and a doll dressed in a walking costume. I mean, I remember when I was nine and I got Barbies. I got one from each of my grandmothers and they both had sewn a whole bunch of ball gowns and outfits and, and crocheted suits and all kinds of stuff. I just loved that. So there's just a little red riding hood, dolls, stockings, and boots. These are all still dolls clothing. So cute. And now you're getting to the baby stuff. So there's a baby's mitten and a baby's bassinet cover and uh, Berlin boots for a baby. And then a little pretty petticoat for a child of four years. So those are the three issues uh, in Weldon's Practical Knitter for the year 1893. In the past few years of Finish It February, I have been using this time to also repair or modify or enhance existing finished items. This year, my husband asked if I could repair a commercially knit sweater that had a hole in one elbow. I had done this sort of repair to one of my own sweaters last year where the knitting had gotten really thin in the elbow. In my sweater, there wasn't an actual hole yet, um, but the knitting was literally just hanging together by a thread. So I was able to use duplicate stitch to reinforce that area that was thin. And then I sewed on elbow patches that I had purchased to protect the sweater going forward. My husband's sweater was a bit different because there was an actual hole with frayed edges and the hole was fairly sizable. I had a general idea of what I was going to need to do because I had done it last year. But there were a few problems and challenges that I had to solve when they cropped up. So first, I had to close the hole itself. The sweater was commercially knit at a fairly fine gauge, so I wanted to do the closure with a fairly thin yarn. The closure yarn didn't need to match the sweater because it was going to be covered with a patch, but it did need to be thin. So I had just found a ball of lace weight yarn in my office after doing my office cleanup in preparation for Finish It February. I never knit with lace weight yarn. This is literally the only ball of lace weight yarn I had. And because I just found it, I knew exactly where it was. So before putting the elbow patch on in order to cover that hole, I wanted to close the hole just to to keep it from being stretched in a funny way, make sure that it was closed up and that it wasn't going to continue to uh, run in either, in, in any direction. So what I did was to take some, this is like a, a two ply lace weight yarn and I just 
kind of went across the hole and then I took a stitch this way and then went across the hole, took a stitch this way. So back and forth to create parallel lines of, of the, the thread. And then I just used weaving. I just went up and down, up and down, up and down. And so I wasn't trying to close it up super tight. This is, this is not the final result. This is just something to, to close the hole. Second, I needed to put something inside the sweater sleeve that would prevent me from sewing the half of the sleeve I was repairing to the other half of the sleeve as I was closing that hole. So my sock ruler uh, worked really well for that. It's a nice piece of flexible plastic and because it had curved ends, I thought it would work really well. I just slid this up inside the sleeve like this. And so that created a nice surface for me that I could do my weaving and I didn't have to um, worry about um, what was on the other side of it. Third, I was worried about the edges of the hole, of the frayed edges just dangling around on the inside and potentially becoming a problem later. Like maybe it would escape the confines of the, the repair and ladder more. So I realized that needle felting around the edges might be a good solution for that. So I had bought some new needle felting tools last fall in order to prepare for sticking a sweater and they worked really well. A lot of people were recommending using needle felting to secure the edges before you cut the, the fabric. So I had these old needle felting needles from like you know, probably 20 years ago, but they have these new tools now that, uh, that look like pens. And so this has got uh, three needles in it I don't know if you can tell, it's got three needles in it, so you can punch three times as much. And then there's this one that has uh, this retractable thing, and it's got, um, let's see if you can see there, there's like five needles in there. So the idea with this is rather than using this sort of old school foam thing for doing needle felting projects, that you put this kind of brush under the fabric, so the fabric's laying on top of there, and then you um, can punch the fabric and you can, you can felt it so that you can secure the back side of it. So that's what I did. I slid this brush inside the sleeve. So it was like this, sitting on top of the brush like that. And then I needle felted it all the way around. So from the right side of the work here, it looks very smooth and it just doesn't really look that much different. So the effect of the felting happens on the other side of the fabric. So let me turn this inside out. So here it is on this side. So all of the, those little ed edges that were all kind of frayed and I was worried might run and get past the little weaving that I had done, those have all been felted and they're all kind of felted against the woven patch that I did. So I'm happy that the hole is, has been secured. So that part is done. These tools were very different from the ones I had bought 18 years ago with this kind of sponge and a single noodle, uh, needle. So I can thank my viewers for introducing me to that process. The fourth thing I needed to do was to buy some ultra suede, which is washable, uh, in a color that would work with the sweater. Last year, I had bought some pre-made ultra suede patches online in a color that worked well for that sweater, but I realized that the color this year might be more of a challenge. Plus, I figured color matching would be easier in person than trying to order something online. It's, it's easier, but it's still a problem for me because I have some slight color vision deficiencies. So I went to a fabric outlet here in town that had quite a few colors, um, but there was only one that looked like it was really going to work well, and I needed confirmation from the clerks that the color I selected would work because I, when something is in that sort of color range, I can't always tell what the real color is. <laughs> Fifth, I had to pick a yarn for sewing the patch to the sweater that would work with the two tones of the sweater yarn and the color of the patch. Some people use regular sewing thread for sewing on patches, but I really prefer using yarn to sew 
onto something that is made from yarn. Again, I needed help with this. I have so much solid color fingering weight yarn and I didn't want to buy new yarn for this purpose because I wouldn't need very much, but I was really struggling to find something that I thought would work from my stash. I tend to buy yarns in the cool tones in part because of my coloring, but also because I just prefer that side of the color wheel because of my color vision issues. This sweater and the patch were sort of warmer tones. So my husband came up and we laid the sweater out and we laid out all the options and he was digging through all of my yarn and he found something that he was going to be happy with, so therefore I was going to be happy with it. Now the patches that I used last year had small holes around the edges to make sewing easier. Because I was using yarn to sew, I would need a needle with a larger eye, but it would also need a sharp tip in order to get through the fabric. I must have had one last year, <laughs> but I couldn't find it in my collection of sewing needles. I could find blunt tip needles with big eyes and I could find a sharp tip needle with a very small eye. So I was looking through all of my needles. I couldn't find anything, but then I remembered that I had this, which is my grandmother's sewing box. I acquired it a few years ago from my mom's house and I opened it up and there were just so many packages of needles, including this one that is a packet of five repair needles. And so there's one that's labeled a carpet needle that worked really well. Then I needed to punch the holes around the circumference of the patch. So I found one heavy duty needle for my sewing machine. I put that in, I didn't thread the machine. I just put this heavy duty needle in and I went around the entire circumference and it put evenly spaced tiny little holes in it that were just going to make it easier for me to poke my needle through the fabric. So the sock ruler that had worked really well when I was just closing the hole uh, using yarn um, wasn't really wide enough when I was sewing the patch on. The patch was coming over the edges and I kept sewing the patch to both layers of the sleeve fabric. So I looked around my office, what do I have that would fill that sleeve, but would also be uh, flat enough? And I remembered this. This is a spurtle. My brother's a woodworker and he made this for me a year or two ago for when I do a blocking stranded color work because I like to turn it inside out and smack it and that kind of evens out all of the stitches. So I have a video on that I'll link to above and, and below. So I was able to use this and it worked really well uh, in order to, uh, to not sew the two layers together. So even though I had a really good idea of what I needed to do to sew on those patches, Ultimately, I got help every step of the way from my husband, from the store clerks, from my viewers, from my grandma and her old sewing box, um, and from my brother. So I just love that, that I got help from so many places. So let's go to the overhead and I will show you what the actual process looked like. So I'm using blanket stitch around here and you probably can't see these little holes. I'm surprised that I can actually see them. Let me see if I can. So there are these, I used the sewing machine with a heavy duty needle to just go around um, the edge here and, and punch these little holes. I do have a really sharp needle, but it really helps. It makes such a difference to be able to go in through one of those holes. It, I know this is gonna go in and out of focus. So if I can go in there, and I can come through. I can do my blanket stitch. I'm gonna back up a little bit. It's just so much easier going through a pre-made hole because I can tell the difference when I don't quite get into the hole, if I miss the hole. It's much, I can get through the fabric, it's just harder, but it's a lot easier if I can, there we go. The yarn I am using is a sock yarn. I think it's a, probably a Regia solid six ply, uh, so like a sport weight yarn that I've split. 
So I'm using three of the six plies. It's not a perfect match, but this is a heathered yarn with kind of two tones, and then this is a solid, and trying to get something that is not a distraction and doesn't clash was um, kind of tricky. And, you know, thinned out like this along the edge, it, um, it seems to work pretty well. I'm going to take this pin out here. So blanket stitch is really easy. I'm going down through my hole and then coming back up through the edge and then over the top of this, this existing yarn. I, I always have to look this up though because last time I did this was a year ago when I put patches on one of my own sweaters. And so I always have to look up how to get started on it and then um, and I like to rotate um, the edge around so that I have the same orientation around the edge the, the entire way. So the, you know, the one strand just rides along the edge of it and then I have the little stitches going through. So here is the elbow patch, um, one of them anyway, um, completed. I do have the other one. The other one has this little weird weirdness here. This is the starting point, but it's also, it just looks darker. Um, there's kind of a doubled yarn, but it is kind of a heathered yarn and this spot just happens to also be darker. There are a few uh, places around here too where uh, you just see the variegation a little bit more in the yarn than maybe you see it in this one. I did this last year on my uh, Red Aaron sweater that's 15, 16 years old at this point. It had worn through one of the elbows and I've been really, uh, really happy um, with the result and just knowing that the elbows are protected and I'll be able to wear it for years longer. And so I'm sure that Michael will be glad to, to get his sweater back as well. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.